let's look at analytical chemistry. And let's start by answering a question, what is analytical chemistry? And what is its purpose? Now, when I first started looking at analytical chemistry and I was taking it in college, I thought that we had kind of solved a lot of things. And I had really looked at it in, in terms of a very simplistic way. And that is characterizing the composition of matter. And you could further break that down into two ways. You could look at it qualitatively or quantitatively. And qualitative is answering the question, is this in our sample? Is a certain substance contained within what we're looking at? So identity of something or finding it, but not really thinking about the concentration or how much is there. And then of course, quantitative. And in fact, some analytical chemistry courses, and the one that I was taking, is was called quantitative chemical analysis, or sometimes just called quant. And this is how much of whatever substance that we're looking at is in the sample. Now, I had this notion and I thought analytical chemistry beyond this was kind of solved and there wasn't a whole lot going on with that. And I had this perspective because there are a lot of analytical techniques that we learned in other classes, such as organic chemistry, where you look at how to take an IR, which is a great qualitative analysis method. And that will tell you what kind of functional groups are in there, and you could even identify what substance is in something, especially if you're looking at a library of compounds. And so I had this view of this is what analytical chemistry is. You analyze substances and, and that's it. And we have all these techniques and the idea is to learn them and then apply them. Well, surely there's more and I'm not sure why at the time I didn't think about this, but uh, there are actually whole journals that are just focused on analytical chemistry. The American Chemistry Society has one that's actually called analytical chemistry. And if you attempted to read every article that came out in one of these journals, you would fail. And just because of the sheer quantity of research and publications that are going on within analytical chemistry. It's a very big and active field. So if we already have a lot of ways of analyzing substances, 
what are analytical chemists actually doing? Well, some at a low level would be conducting analytical analysis of, of substances. So you could be in a laboratory technician role and you could say that you're doing analytical chemistry, but that doesn't really answer what is the research component or what is an, a high level analytical chemist going to do. And so let's talk about that. One of the things that they do is develop methods. All of those methods that were developed before that you might have done in organic chemistry or uh, general chemistry, titration, some of these other analytical methods, those were developed by an analytical chemist or at least a chemist that was doing analytical chemistry. They take something that we don't know how to do and invent a new method, or they take uh, a substance that was made by, say, an organic chemist, and they investigate its properties and look at what that could be used for in doing an analysis. So we develop methods. We also are looking at difficult samples. And developing methods includes dealing with preparing the sample. So So tricky samples. A lot of these are biological samples, so they could be medically related. And if you know anything about biochemistry or biological things, there's a lot of different molecules contained in those samples. And so you have to have something that either separates those sample or those substances from each other or targets one anal analyte at a time. That way you can isolate and measure that one piece. Also, a lot of biologically relevant material is at a very low concentration, and so it's difficult to see. We also look for interference. If, for example, we were running an analytical method to measure the amount of chlorine in a substance, chloride, let's say it's in the ion form, and we chose to do gravimetric analysis on it, we could add silver to the chloride and precipitate it. But if there was a different halide, such as bromine or iodine, ions in the solution too, then they would also precipitate and that would end up in our measurement and that would be an example of interference. This is a very simple example of interference, but there are more complicated ones out there. And analytical chemists look for interferences and how to deal with them, either by removing them or by making a new method that does not react with the interference. The other thing that you can do is maybe there is a method that exists and it is acceptable for measuring a substance. And this used to happen a lot when mining for ores. And you would be digging up a certain area and you'd be looking for where the ore is going. So you're trying to track where what I'm mining is going in the ground because it's not evenly distributed. So you want to track the highest concentration of this material. Well, 
the original methods for the analysis used to take three days to complete. It involved several precipitations carefully in a particular order so that you would not have interference from other material in there. It would be nice if we had some method that targeted the ore, the particular substance that we were looking for. And so analytical chemists saw that there are different substances that will selectively precipitate one element versus another. And they were able to use this to reduce the analysis time. So with selective precipitation, you can accomplish the same analysis within one day. which is significantly better than three days. It utilizes a lot less chemicals as well, and so we can more effectively direct our mining operations and react faster. That saves money. And, and then, of course, now we have a way with an atomic spectrometer to measure the sample very, very rapidly. With an atomic spectrometer, essentially as soon as you're able to dissolve and properly dilute the sample, you can have an answer to your analysis question because the spectrometer takes only about a minute or two per sample to give you a result. And that was developed using analytical chemistry, or de developing that was a function of analytical chemistry. So we're able to look at more complicated samples that are in lower concentrations. We're able to look for things that are significantly faster and less expensive. And we're able to deal with more interferences. These are things that an analytical chemist will think about and focus on, where other chemists are focused on developing or investigating new materials or properties of new materials, and they may not understand all of the analytical implications and they may just be applying a known analytical method, but there could be an interference or there could be a faster way of doing the analysis. And as we invent more new materials and ask harder questions to answer, that's where analytical chemistry looks at it. We also look to develop methods for all of the different ways of ana analyzing something. So that way we have more than just, say, a titration or a gravimetric analysis in order to analyze something. We may have an electrochemical way to analyze it, or we may have a spectroscopic way. Sometimes it's helpful to have more than one way because that way you may not have all of the different types of equipment contained within a particular laboratory. And so if you have a method that works with the analytical instruments that you currently have, that could be an advantage. So this is a little bit about what an analytical chemist actually does, and we'll ex be exploring analytical chemistry more in the upcoming videos. So. We'll see you in the next videos.